this faculty panel, which is um, a faculty panel about answering questions about teaching careers in higher ed. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists to you, and then I have a few questions that have been submitted by you all in advance. Uh, we got quite a few questions, and they ended up pretty much being about three main themes. And so I'm going to ask the faculty members a question in each theme that kind of summarizes all of those questions in that theme. And then after we're done with those three questions, then we'll open it up to the rest of you, just like we did in the previous panel. Um, so you know, um, my name is Mindy Collin. I work with Lisa in the Office of Instructional Development. Uh, and we're going to start off uh, on this side, this is Dr. Diane Mackey. She's from here, from UCSB in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Uh, and I will read a little bit, a little bio about each of these people to you. Um, she will be giving a presentation this afternoon about what chairs want when they are hiring somebody for a teaching position. Dr. Mackey has authored and co-authored textbooks and more than 150 articles and chapters on social influence and intergroup relations. As a fellow of multiple associations, she has served as on the associate editorial boards of most major psychology journals. Dr. Mel Mackey helped develop the UCSB Certificate for College and University Teaching, which we call the CCUT, and has served as its director since its inception. Just so you know, Dr. Mackey reads every single C-cut portfolio that is submitted. And they're all amazingly good. They are. <laughs> I steal your ideas to use in my classes. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Damon Willick joins us from Loyola Marymount University. He is in the Department of Art History there. Uh, he will be giving a presentation this afternoon on navigating the job search process. Um, He's the chair of the Department of Art History right now at LMU. He teaches courses in modern and contemporary art and researches the American visual culture of the po post-World War II era. He is a book author and has written for many journals and museum catalog essays. Dr. Willick is an active curator and art critic and currently serves as a contributing editor of the Journal of Extra Contemporary Art Quarterly. Um, Dr. Willick just told me that he did his freshman year here at UCSB. And um, I joined him, or I, I was at Loyola Marymount University 10 years ago also. So we have a little bit of a connection there. Loyola Marymount University is the second most beautiful campus <laughs> apart from this one <laughs> in the world. It also overlooks the Pacific. It's really beautiful. Um, Dr. Jens Kuhn is from Santa Barbara City College. Uh, where he is the dean for, and this is kind of hard, educational programs, math, sciences, I don't know what SOML is, ES and English as a second language. What is The School SOML? of Modern Languages. The School of Modern Languages. So he's dean of many things <laughs> there. Um, he received his PhD in chemistry from UCSB and taught at several institutions before coming to City College 10 years ago, uh, where he was a faculty member in the Department of Chemistry. He also acted as department chair for five years prior to moving into his current administrative position as a dean. He collaborates extensively with the Center for Science and Engineering Partnerships here at UCSB, and they are co-sponsors of this event. Uh, he represents Santa Barbara City College on the Regional Alliance for Hispanic Serving Institutions, which UCSB is also a Hispanic serving institution. And he has served as a project director and PI on several STEM related projects and initiatives funded through the Department of Education and the National Science Foundation programs. Dr. Elizabeth Loem joins us uh, from Cal Poly, and actually I should say Dr. Kuhn gave us a presentation this morning um, on teaching careers at community college. And Dr. Loem gave us a presentation this morning about doing teaching demos. And so she joins us from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in, from the Department of Political Science, where you are a chair. 
Uh, she is the winner of the 2017 Academic Senate Distinguished Teaching Award, the CLA Early Career for, in Teaching Award, and um, Achievement in the Institutional Professional Service Early Career Award also. Her teaching focuses on providing active learning experiences that engage students in the production, analysis, and use of information, developing leadership and management skills, and sometimes, when she's very lucky, politics and science fiction. <laughs> so I'd like to welcome you all here uh, and would ask you to, I'm just going to ask you to go from one end to the other for these first three questions. Uh, the first question is from our theme about what it's like to be a professor, and especially what it's like to be a new professor at your institution. So, the question is, can you very briefly describe a typical month in the life of a new professor? <coughs> what are the priorities and main responsibilities? Dr. Mackey, would you like to start? Sure. So. Um as you can tell, it's been a long time since I'm a, I was a new professor. I came to UCSB in 1984, it's been, and I've been here ever since. Um, but as chair, in the last two years, I have hired eight assistant professors, so I know a lot about what assistant professors do do, or at least what I want them to be doing in the, in the, in the first month. Okay, and so this is it's an interesting forum here because there are uh, two very distinct types of jobs in an R1 institution. One is a, a, research prof a research professor, your basic vanilla kind of professor that you all know and work with. Um, and more recently, we've um, been hiring teaching professors who are scholars and who are going to become master teachers. Um, and that's a, a slightly different track. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both of them. But so if you're a young research professor and you got hired by UCSB, what you are doing, probably your highest priority at first is getting your lab set up, okay? Getting your research program set up, which is an amazingly complex thing to be doing. Um, and secondarily, and, and I say this after you've moved here and you've found a place to live and you've done all the, you've set up your bank accounts and all the normal things, put your kids in school and all the, all the normal things you have to get done. But professionally, you, you want to get your research program up and running, okay? Because that is the number one thing that you are going to be um, evaluated on. And you, in the UC system, for example, you get evaluated every two years, so evaluations come up quickly. So get your research program up and running. Um, you will be asked to teach, okay? Uh, we always give teaching breaks for new professors, but that doesn't mean that you don't teach at all. You just teach less than a regular, more senior faculty member. Um, and I would say that those should be your top two priorities as a, as a new professor. So thinking about that question, I'm just uh, thinking back on when I started as an assistant professor at LMU. Um, and I'll talk you through maybe the first month of not knowing where to park. And so there are <laughs> just being new on campus and um, being unfamiliar with faces, right? So you don't know who you're speaking with. You don't know, um, who, the, you know who the associate deans are. and. Um, who is the head of facilities management. I mean, just everything is new, so there's some of that process. Um, but in terms of a place like LMU, um, and I heard one of the graduate students who just recently got hired, um, I was told explicitly that I had to have 40% research, 40% teaching, and 20% service was what my, would be how I gained tenure. And so, um, but I also had um, my graduate advisor at UCLA tell me that my first year should be about teaching. And it should be about creating the classes that would sustain me f past tenure. Um, so I took that first year really to focus on my teaching and, and to make sure that when I walked in the classroom, I, I was prepared. And if you've ever taught classes for the first time, that means you're staying up late. Um, and it means that you're walking into class, or at least I was, with 30 pages of notes, um, and then just, you know, like losing my place in the first five minutes, and um, focusing on the students that were making faces at me because I was maybe more confusing than a more senior teacher. Um, but it gets 
easier. And I have to say, by the end of the first month, um, I had my footing. I felt part of a community. Um, and then once you have that, then you can go to the library and start to restart your research projects. Um, and for me, being in the humanities, that means writing. Uh, but the first month was really about preparing my classes and finding some footing for being a new teacher. So I would echo um, a lot of what's been said that, you know, the first month or the first, you know, maybe even the semester, first semester or whatnot is, uh, or quarter, depending on where you're at, um, is really about trying to keep your head above water similarly to, you know, when you're starting at a new school as a student, right? You're trying to figure out, you know, how do I log into my computer? You know, how do I, you know, make sure this doesn't break or, you know, whatever, or who do I call if this does break or, you know, what's even my phone extension or what do I know? Right? <laughs> um, and so, so there's all of that, which, you know, sounds silly, but it's really, it, it's, I mean, just like being a new student someplace else, it's really no different, right? Um, and then at a community college, the, uh, the focus obviously is going to be on teaching. And so similarly to what you just heard, um, you know, it's surprising how, you know, how much time it takes to, you know, get uh, acclimated in a new place, but also to maybe, you know, prepare your classes or, you know, teach your classes or your labs or set up your labs or this and that. So there's a general understanding that a new faculty member's um, first load is reduced. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, at a community college, you, you won't have a reduced teaching load because that's what it is all about. But, but you typically won't be expected to, you know, do these other kinds of things like serve on committees or participate in, you know, other departmental or campus-wide activities, um, not because you're not welcome to, but simply because you'll find that you just don't have the time. Um, and so the, the first month of the first semester is, is again, sort of focused on, you know, uh, <laughs> Being at least uh, you know a couple of pages ahead of the students in the textbook and uh, <laughs> and um, you know trying to uh, you know figure out even if you've taught a class before right it may have been a different place and you know at community college you need to make sure that your classes uh, transfer and articulate and this and that there's all sorts of nuances that that will take you know much more time than than seems to be obvious and and so uh, again there's an understanding that that's the case and so you'll have fewer other things going on and, and we'll be spending most of your time doing those kinds of things. So. so I would say my first year experience at Cal Poly was hopefully will not be like what yours will be. Um, I came in with a significant administrative job as well. So I had responsibility for figuring out how to manage a program. So all of those who am I talking to and what do I need and how do I schedule and how do I hire. Um, hopefully that won't fall to you, but sometimes it does. Um, so I think we hire people who are, have strong research programs and hire people who are strong teachers. Uh, and so your first year will be figuring out which of those you're, uh, you need to build up the most. So it might be that you're good on the teaching, right? And you feel pretty secure there, but you need to work on, you need to build up your teaching or research side. And if, if not, it might be you need to um, build up your teaching and put your research on hold. You'll figure out that balance. I think one of the things that first year faculty don't anticipate um, is figuring out how to say no, right? That um, you, we do the same thing. We try and protect our first year faculty. Um, we try and protect faculty up until they go up for tenure and promotion and then the reins are off and we'll ask you to do a lot of things. But you still get asked to do a lot of things. Right? And, and you have to learn how to judge which opportunities teaching, research, and service are right for you um, and which aren't and how to say no without alienating um, people that you may need later. Don't say no to me. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you very much for those insights. The second question has to do with skills that new professors may need to develop. So the question is, when you see new professors come on board at your institution, <clears throat> what is one skill that they commonly need to develop and that could have been developed during graduate school? Oh, do I get to start? Let's start down at that end. You've got to learn how to say no. 
<laughs> yeah. It's easy. It's, so, um, and, and it is it is something that um, hopefully you've had the chance to learn to develop. So in graduate school, I was asked to teach a class in Latin American politics, which would be fine except for my fields were public policy and research methods. And so the way I said no, because I didn't know anything about Latin American politics, was do I have to know the countries that are considered Latin American to teach Latin American politics? <laughs> now, I knew what countries were included in that list, and I knew some about politics, but I also knew I wasn't prepared to and could not get myself up to speed to offer a quality undergraduate higher, upper division class in Latin American politics, um, and that I would be doing a disservice to um, the students and myself and the department by doing that. You have to figure out how to, how to do that, right? And not have it impact your career later. And I think that's one of those skills that you really underestimate as a graduate student. I would agree with that, that that's an important one. Maybe, maybe another one um, related to the classroom, well, there's a couple that come to mind, but, but one of them maybe would be to, to ha have sort of a way of, of looking at um, how to reach your students on more than sort of a superficial kind of level, meaning, you know, how do you really look at, um, you know, student success in a particular class and carefully analyze that without just, you know, simply looking at the numbers and saying, well, you know, there's no problem or there's a problem or maybe there's a little bit of a problem. So, so how, do you, how do you go from looking at numbers like that to changes in the classroom uh, whatever that might be, that might be the instruction, or it might be the classroom setup, or it might be the type of lab that you're doing, or it might have nothing to do with the instructor, or whatever. But uh, but just looking at uh, looking at that and and sort of going to the next step of, you know, how wh where, you know, if there is an issue, or if there is something that you're not happy with, um, or a potential area for improvement, how do you go from there to, how do you decide what the source of this might be and how do you go from there to changing things around, um, you know, beyond the obvious of, you know, talking to people and, and this and that, so. So to build off of the ability to say no, um, I also think it's very important to be present and that was something that I forced myself um, instead of doing research at home or grading at home, but just being around campus makes a big difference. Um, you get to know your students better, you get to know your colleagues. Um, I think as a first year professor, it's important that your senior faculty sees you as committed to the institution. So if there were events after work, um, try, to, try to make it and try to just be, be there. Um, I'm naturally, more inclined to go home. Um, and I can do that now that I'm beyond the junior faculty level. Um, so I'm not as present as I was as a first through fifth year professor, but I have two junior faculty members in, in my department right now, and one is always present and the other isn't. And I just know that the perception above me is that one is doing everything that they need to do and the other isn't, right? And, 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 and so, you know, now that I think back on it, um, I do think that idea of presentness is really important. And I would, add, well, I think all of these are great, great skills. So you're supposed to learn all of these, but the more you do, the better it is. I'd add another one is um, learning to work with people, all right? Often as, um, PhD students, you, you, you sort of work as a team, but you're encouraged to be independent. You're encouraged to run your own shop, to show that they're all your ideas and those kinds of things. And it turns out that when you actually have a position, those, yes, you're supposed to do that, but more important skills are being able to manage people and work as part of a team. On the teaching side, you'll probably have to deal with TAs. You may have a bevy, a team of TAs that you have to organize, let alone all the, the students in the class. And in the lab, you may get the opportunity for the first time to be in charge of a postdoc, or to, and you're going to be expected to recruit graduate students. And for some new faculty, that's like, they've never done anything like that. They've never, they've been on the other side of it, but they've never thought about what was actually going on and why you might be doing this. So I would, you know, I would 
that I think that would be a great skill to look, to think about more consciously when you were a graduate student about the people management team building side of things. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, we've got one more question and it is what is one thing that makes a recent graduate's job application stand out to a search committee at your institution? I'm going to let anybody start who wants to Well, I can just start because it's easy if it, <laughs> for, for us. I mean, and this is cynical, and it's pro, you know, it, it's your different audience that perhaps because you here because you care about teaching, but at a research one selective institution, what matters when we're trying to hire research faculty are publications, even as a you know graduate student or a postdoc, right? And if it doesn't. It can sometimes be that somebody's letters of recommendation say this guy or woman walks on water and is Isaac Newton reincarnated um, <laughs> and overlook the fact that they've never actually produced something. Um, but otherwise, if you haven't been able to produce anything, then your vita will be in the let's not look further at pile. So for a school like Loyola Marymount, where it's more balanced, um, I would say that the cover letter needs to uh, demonstrate an understanding of the uniqueness of the institution. So, and I'll be talking about this further this afternoon, but if you're applying to a liberal arts university, talk about teaching and talk about how, let's say, your research does influence how you approach your teaching, right? Because they're gonna, that's what they're gonna be looking for, is that balance. But there needs to be some demonstration right at the start, because if I'm looking through 100 applications, and it let's say get, it's the greatest Isaac yeah. Newton reincarnate, <laughs> but they have Nipotone. the inability to express why they would do well at LMU, they're not gonna make the phone interview. I sort of have the same kind of answer. Um, it's the uh, it's the making the connection to the institution. Um, now the institution in my case is different, right? It's a community college, and so it's the teaching experience that's going to make the difference. And and uh, more specifically, the and this goes back again to making the connection to the institution. More specifically, the teaching experience at a community college. Um, so you know to sort of be devil's advocate if, if somebody, um, you know, uh, talks about their research at a UC um, and their TA experience at a four-year institution, then that's probably not going to make the top of the list for a teaching application at a community college, right? Uh, so at Cal Poly, we're equally balanced. I mean, we, we, I don't think in our department we've hired someone without a publication out of graduate school since I've been there. But we also look for teaching experience, and we're also looking for that connection that you understand the institution you're applying to. Now at Cal Poly, for those of you who don't know and haven't applied for jobs at Cal Poly, we have this, our sort of motto is learn by doing. <clears throat> so you can bet the number of times that the phrase learn by doing appears in a cover letter. <laughs> it's a lot. Right? Almost every letter has this phrase, I really like your learn by doing philosophy. That's good. You need to authentically demonstrate in your cover letter how that applies, right? Don't just use the phrase, think about what that means and how that informs how you see yourself, right? Because um, we will read through lots of cover letters and it becomes really easy to pick out the sort of, I love your learn by doing philosophy. <laughs> To, as opposed to someone who has made that connection and uh, sort of integrates the, the spirit of that throughout the letter. So make sure that connection that you're making is authentic. That takes time, right? But your cover letter is, is a make or break in a lot of ways. And it, you need to be able to demonstrate all of those things. All right. It is now your turn. We have about half an hour. Okay, so I'm going to ask you to Please make your questions specific, and if you can, address it to a specific uh, person, because we won't have everybody answer every question unless it's a question that applies to everybody, okay? So um, 
I saw Kelly first, and then we're just gonna kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, okay, so I, I think my most specific addressment would be to, to Damon. Um, so this is a question about trying to be present, but at the same time also getting work done. Mm -hmm. Speaking from somebody who was probably too present the first three years of her PhD, <laughs> and now totally not present her last three years of her PhD, so I can get work done, right? So how yeah. do you do that without being rude, in a sense? Like, That's a really tough question for me to answer, because my the way that I work is in brief spurts of focus and then a lot of wasted time. So, no, really. <laughs> so what that meant was I was in my office and I had my door open and when I wasn't in that f focus state, then I would, you know, talk to my colleagues or I would walk to the library and get a coffee and come back, you know. So, we all have our working methods, and what works for us is unique to us. Um, but to be present, I think just the fact that I was, well, first of all, I had an office, which was amazing, right? <laughs> I couldn't believe that I had gotten this position. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time in my office, and that counted, because then when people were walking by my door, they would say hello, right? So they got to know me a little bit more than just, oh, I'm walking to class, I don't have time to talk. Hi, um, my name is Marina. I'm a fifth year in Chicana Chicano Studies. And um, I'm wondering if uh, whoever, I guess this could apply to anybody, so, or everybody, but um, I'm wondering at your various institutions, what are the kinds of relationships that faculty foster with students? Because for example, Student success, that phrase, very big in CCs, not really a thing at a UC from what I've seen. I, I rarely hear faculty saying student success in conversations about you know, teaching and our work here. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the culture and your various kinds of institutions and your relationship with the students. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try to start this time. Um, the, so, so yes, there, I, I think I would echo your statement about you know, uh, student success being you know, really important at, at community colleges, right? Because that's, the teaching is what's going to make you and break you, right? There might be other activities and, and you might have some research collaborations and this and that, but it's the teaching that's going to really, like I said, make you and break you. But, and so what, you know, what you'll see is that, you know, um, Meaningful uh, interactions with your students and strong connections to your students are really important in terms of being able to address student success, right? So, uh, you know, part of that is is the reason why classes in community colleges are typically smaller in size than they are at, at other institutions. But that's still, you know, if you have a large lecture class, you're still looking at you know 150 students, and you know you can't know everybody in there, right? So, so it's um, it's really about. Um, being present, actually, I like that um, because you know being available to your students and being able to just have, you know, little conversations here or there, being available in office hours, being open, being approachable, you know, all those things will enable you to get to know your students better. And then if you have the luxury of being maybe in the sciences where you have a lab that you're going to be teaching where the ratio is you know maybe like 20 students in your lab, then you can get to know everybody. And, and it's really about that, it's about, it's about these personal one-to-one, one-on-one interactions where you get to know your students and then you can understand where they're coming from and understand what their struggles might be and how that might have an impact on student success that may have nothing to do with your particular lecture or whatever, right? So, so you know, being present, being approachable, being available, being open to students is really, is really key. And yes, it's, it's huge at, at uh, community college. I was wondering what you would recommend when someone receives a job offer, or what should they do in terms of negotiation? Negotiate. <laughs> Could you give a bit more detail on that? <laughs> so I think, it, I, I can, I think it will depend on the, so at Cal Poly we're incredibly constrained salary-wise. We're a unionized campus, we have steps, budgetarily it's always a fight. Um, so salary, you might not be able to negotiate on, but 
you can negotiate on startup package. You can negotiate on um, travel money. You can negotiate on equipment, right? So I think don't um, be so excited about the prospect of having a job that you lose the opportunity to negotiate. Um, and then figure out what you can negotiate on, right? And some years you'll, there'll be more room to negotiate and, and others there won't be, but you won't get for what you don't ask for. So figure out where, where universities have movement because frequently there are, there are places where there's soft spots, right? Um, maybe think about re a reduced teaching load, right? Or um, increased support for uh, teaching assistance or research assistance, right? Figure out where the soft spots are and don't be afraid to press on them. You have to press respectfully and politely, but press on them. And, and particularly if you can justify those in terms of meeting the goals mm -hmm. of the institution. Agreed. Right? So I need some travel mm -hmm. money to go to teaching conferences so that I'm up to speed on all the best practices. Or I need a little bit of lab startup because one of my passions is getting undergraduates working in the lab and, and teaching them how to create knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay? Those, those are going to be things that a chair is more willing to uh, negotiate on than you saying, I want to go to three international conferences a year, preferably right. in Hawaii. Right. Okay. <laughs> right? So yeah. if you can. And it, it, may, it makes a huge difference, and the amounts may not be sound that big, but um, this year I had a, a first year starting faculty member negotiate for a $13,000 startup package, and I had another, um, we had other faculty members who didn't negotiate for a startup package. It makes a difference. Even, it, even though the amount of money may be small globally, for you starting out, it could be a huge difference. Right? And also, sometimes you negotiate with the chair, sometimes you negotiate with the dean. Right. Yeah. So be prepared for that. So it depends on the size yep. of the yep. operation. Yep. Right. So I was going to say, um, it's the dean that negotiates mm -hmm. um, at a school for like LMU, too. and which is great because then you're not, you're not negotiating right. with your colleagues or your future colleagues. You are negotiating mm -hmm. with the administration. And this is what they do, yep. right? And 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 they and they never take it personally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's your time, mm -hmm. right? Before you mm -hmm. sign that contract, that is your time mm -hmm. to see, um, yeah, to that's get it. what you need yeah. or what you want. And the UC, especially if you're a, a sought-after researcher, teacher who has competing offers, then you negotiate and negotiate yeah. and negotiate yeah. because. We will match, if we want you, we will match any written offer that you can show us. I mean, just because you say UCLA is going to give me four times more salary than you offered me, I'm, I'm not mm -hmm. going to be impressed by that. But if you show me an offer, our dean is very competitive. He, you know, he'll match anything. And in my situation, I'm, the, I'm your advocate with the dean. Yep. You, you tell me what you want. I sometimes put you in touch with reality, but if I, <laughs> but I think if it's, but I think if I can justify it to the dean, then I'm your agent with the dean. We, you know, so I end up negotiating with the dean for you. And at the UC, you can negotiate on lots of things. There are a lot of, um, there are a lot of housing benefits. There are uh, salary. There's a lab. There's startup. There's personnel. There's all kinds of things that you can that you can negotiate on. Uh, a lot of departments have kind of standardized reductions so that it takes you know, some of the back and forth sameness out of the. So in psych and brain sciences, we give a reduced teaching load for four years. And we just do that for everybody so that n nobody has to negotiate it every time they come in, right? So, um, but I was a little taken back in the earlier panel when somebody said that they'd been told to ask for 20% more. Um, I think that that would put you in somewhat of a difficult position with who you, you know, I mean, it, it is an entry position. There are a lot of people who want these jobs. You're, you're being offered the job, but trust me, they have somebody in the second position and the third position and the fourth position who they also think are pretty good. So I wouldn't negotiate yourself out of the, out of the position, but again, Whenever you can align getting more with the goals of the institution, then you know that makes you stand out a little bit. Um, 
Um, so as deans and chairs, you all um, contribute a lot to the service in, at your respective institutions. So I was wondering if that's something, simply something that was expected of you or if you sought out this position. Um, and I, I'm just curious because I know it works differently at every place. I'd be curious to hear your paths to where you are today. So it was my time to be chair. <laughs> there was, no, really, it, it, yeah. it was once I got tenure, then, then I knew uh, once the current chair, once she uh, had served for four years, then it would be my turn. Um, and that's how it works usually, um, at least in smaller departments where everyone has to step up at some point. Um, I have a teaching course load reduction, which is, I'd rather be teaching, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, but I see it as my service, right? I did my, you know, I had um, other sacrificed so that I could focus to get tenure, and now it's my turn. So, um, so in, in some cases, I, so I, I would say this varies a little bit um, with uh, the type of institution and then also the. Um, um, the size of the department uh, and the sort of the dynamics, the personnel dynamics within the department. So in some cases, it's exactly like you just heard. And, and then in other cases, I found it to be, uh, you know, sort of not on a rotational kind of basis because some folks are just really good at, uh, you know, getting out of that in some ways or they really don't want to do it or maybe they just, maybe everybody else doesn't, doesn't want them want to do it, to right? Do it right? So I mean, there's those <laughs> folks too. But but so so I guess what I'm saying is that there's no, uh, there are sort of different paths to that. There's not one single path and it depends a little bit on, on your, you know, on, uh, you know, sort of your tra uh, trajectory and, and, and how you're interested in that, but also the department dynamics and the, the school dynamics and things along those lines, so. Yeah, I did not start my career thinking, wow, what I really want to do is be an administrator. I did not, I did not start that way. But um, through that negotiation process, one of the things that happened is they lost their graduate program coordinator in, in the department. So they asked me to do that my first year. I did that for then 10 years. And then they're like, well, we'd like you also now to be a center director. So I did that for a few years. And then it was, um, there was an opportunity um, to become chair and I thought, you know what, I have, sorry, I have to do the math, uh, eight years of experience administering different things here. I can see some places that I can improve the lives of my faculty and the programs for our students and um, opportunities for our students to do great things. Um, and so I, I took it. Uh, and it is, I used to operate on a sort of rotating basis and now I don't know that, I don't know when it will rotate again. <laughs> like, and so that's one of those part of learning to say no is figuring out also when to say yes. Right? Some of those opportunities that get offered to you can be life changing in a way you didn't anticipate and you could fall in love with it. Now I wouldn't say I love being an administrator, but I see the chance to do good work. Yeah. And so um, if that chance arises, try it. See if you like it. It could open up something completely different for you. Or it could actually reaffirm your long-held standing belief that you did not want to be an administrator. But you won't know it until you try it. And so it's sort of, I've been enjoyed it, enjoyed it mostly. <laughs> um, but I've learned a tremendous amount from it. Yeah, and I've loved it. I'm not sure that I thought I would start out being an administrator. But I'm bossy, and I like to change things, and I'm organized. And like Elizabeth, it's, it's the way to bring about social change in your world. And so, and for me, it's also sort of speaks to a nice balance in my life. So, you know, I love my research, but research develops slowly. And you're not going to solve a problem in two days, right? And you're, it's, so it's a sort of a long, drawn out kind of project. But in administration, sometimes I can solve somebody's problem in two days. Somebody can't do something because of some paperwork or some thing or something that we've been doing the same way for 100 years. When somebody says, oh, yeah, we should be doing this completely differently, I can make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I can make it happen in a week. And so it's a different kind of skill. And so I come in and out of administration because I love both of them. So. Um, you know, we don't rotate it. We don't rotate the chair. We always have a problem of 
the, the set of people who want to be chair and who the other faculty will accept as chair is very small. Yeah. Is it an N of one? Yes. No, no, but well, sometimes it is. Okay, six years ago it was an N of mm -hmm. one and I was the one, but you know, I, this is my last quarter of chair. I've been chair for six years and, and now we've actually got a bigger pool of people who want to be chair, which is great. But yeah, fun, fun different skills. Mm -hmm. And in the UC, uh, service is, you know, we, do, we, we get evaluated on research, teaching, service, and professional activities. So I'd say it was probably 30, 30, 20, I do the math, I, you know. Re re research is most, teaching is next, but service is after that, you know, and you don't, it's not just internal service, you have to serve on academic senate committees. You have to help pretend that you're helping run the UC. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> excellent phrasing. <laughs> Um, I think this question, I think uh, for Dr. Willick and, and Dr. Loam, you mentioned that at your institutions, 40% research, 40% teaching. When you have a new line uh, for, and you're looking at CVs, when it comes to that body of research, are you looking at how many publications, the type of journals, the quality, is there a clear trajectory that you're looking for specifically with their research program? Since it's 40% and teaching weighs just as much, how much emphasis do you put on the research you see initially? You know, I think it depends on the candidate and it depends on their entire application packet. So you might see, okay, they only have one publication, but then in, in a letter of recommendation, their dissertation advisor sees the dissertation as having great potential for either many articles or as being a book publication. You know, so that person, though, they might have less publications than someone that has let's say five publications coming out of graduate school um, would be weighed equally. Um, you know, so, so it really depends. Um, but there has to be a demonstration that there is potential because a search committee doesn't want to hire someone that's not going to get tenure because then that would mean that we'd have to wasted investment. do the search again. And so um, though there isn't just one equation, we are definitely looking at potential whether that means they have it coming in or it's something down the line. Yeah, I concur. I think um, we pay attention to, to journal outlet or, or outlet, um, but we're really interested in the potential. So that you've, in your cover letter and in your letters of recommendation, have made the case that this is the start of a, a, an agenda mm -hmm. and, and that you have a clear sense of what that agenda is. No one's going to hold you to that agenda specifically, but that you have actually thought about what that plan looks like. Um, and then it, it gets weighed on the, uh, just on the basis of the materials presented in the packet, it probably gets weighed about as equally as teaching does. Um, and then once it becomes to once it comes to the actual on-campus interview, uh, your teaching presentation can sink you faster than your research presentation at Cal Poly in our department. Mm -hmm. okay. Another question. Yeah. Uh, Hi. This question is for uh, international applicants. Mm -hmm. Like. After graduate school, if you move to industry, sometimes the companies would sponsor your H-1B visa. And do you know something similar at your institute where you sponsor uh, visas for your international applicants? Well, the UC does. So we don't look at where you come from when we decide we want you. So if we want you, we say, this is the person that we want to hire, and the administration needs to make it happen. So we have an office of uh, international scholars and students, and they help facilitate the visa process. Same. Yeah, same. Not the same. Community colleges do not. <laughs> sorry, sorry for the bad news. But um, community colleges do not sponsor um, international applicants. Uh, this is a question for Dean Kuhn. Um, you mentioned briefly something about uh, doing uh, research activities in collaboration with the people outside of the CC. Can you speak a little more to that in terms of how many faculty do that? Um, is it typical of CC professors to do 
uh, a little bit of research outside the time teaching and what that's like? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's not typical, certainly not typical, um, but so what I was, uh, the reason why I mentioned it earlier is because um, I think earlier this morning a question came up about, uh, you know, what some of these, these other activities are that, that uh, you know, you might be engaged in, in uh, at a community college. So, so at a community college, obviously what, uh, what's going to make you and break you is the teaching. Um, but then there are, other, there are other commitments that are required, uh, you know, the service commitment that looks different a little bit from place to place. But, uh, but then there are also other things that faculty will seek out uh, that they're really interested in and that they uh, might pursue. And, and so for some folks, that might be a summer project. Uh, typically, teaching contracts at community colleges are nine or 10 months appointments. Um, uh, with the option to teach during the summer, so some folks do that. Some folks do other projects during the summer, and then some folks, um, but it's not, I don't want to give the impression that it's common um, that uh, folks have a, have a research project on the side, but it does happen. Um, and so the way they make it work is the, the, the conundrum that you're in is, is that community colleges don't have the research instrumentation that you would have at a UC, right? So really the only way to make that work is if you have, you know, if you have the luxury like being at SBCC where UCSB is, you know, 10 miles down the road, right? Then, and if you have connections, then you might be able to take advantage of instrumentation that you would be able to use, um, you know, with students. But then what that means is that these are typically, you know, these are undergraduate research projects or undergraduate research uh, um, uh, you know, they might be summer projects or they might be year-long projects or whatnot. So there are some folks that do that. Um, and then there are some, so year-long, um, when they have, you know, an institution they can collaborate with. Um, and then there are some folks who use their summer to do research at institutions uh, that they have connections to. Uh, so those are probably the two most common ones. But overall, I don't, I don't want to give the impression that it's common in general. Um, but it, 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 um, it, it, does, it does happen, and that's sort of how they make it work. Uh, my question has to do with uh, kind of new prep and, and teaching and just thinking about, you know, starting out as a new faculty member. Um, to what extent at each of your institutions are these new faculty members engaging in new preps every quarter? You know, I'm sure it's like 1-1 one, one or 2-2 two, two or City College is what, a 4-4 four, four or something like that, right? 3-3. Three, three. Um, but to what extent are those classes like have to be new preps? How much are you kind of doing different classes or are you able to kind of negotiate to teach the same class a few quarters in a row? Well, well I can speak to that. I've been talking mainly about the UC as a research institution. Um, and in my presentation later today, I'm going to be talking about teaching positions because there are actually focused teaching positions. Um, but for example, uh, a full-time lecturer somebody who's just brought in to, to, to teach in the UC system has a nominal course load of nine classes, so that's three, three, three through the quarters. We always reduce that where there are ways to reduce it. We, we use something that's called equivalencies, other things that we want teaching faculty to accomplish. Um, and we're very sensitive to um, the time that's put into new prep. And so, and we're, and we're also hiring people often because we have certain needs that we want those people to, to fill. So we're bringing you in to develop the courses that you will teach. So, you know, once you've developed them and you've put a lot of work into them, we're not going to say, okay, now we want you to teach in a completely different area. So, so there is repetition and there is some reduction in teaching load. Uh, when I started, that was not the case. Um, when I started in my first two years, I had 12 new preps. Um, and part of that was just because I was teaching in a graduate program, and in, graduate, in our graduate program, you couldn't teach the same class more than once a year, right? That was just sort of the, na I'm, that was the nature of the job. We do a much better job now because the, the department has grown enough where we really try and protect new faculty. So um, Cal Poly is a 333 reduced by contract down to a 222. My faculty members starting this fall have, I think, three or four preps that they'll teach for the next two years. Mm -hmm. okay. And then how that spreads out across the year, it depends on them. Some people like to teach the same two classes in a quarter. Some people like to spread it out. But I, we work with the new faculty member to try and determine what, is the, what best fits their thinking and approach. 
So I would agree. I think it's a, it's a combination of a specific need for the department. Um, in you know with while at the same time having an understanding that you know everybody's well aware of you know the number of preps is going to have a huge impact on on the success of a, a particular faculty member and as mentioned earlier you know the institution and the department is making an investment and wants the faculty member to be successful so there is you know it's it's really something that is worked out on an individual basis but it is something that is um, you know folks are keenly aware of uh, the fact that you know, a new faculty member shouldn't be getting too many new preps. Um, but the specifics, pre the specific preps that that are going to be happening are usually due to the particular need that's that's come up in the department. Um, there's been a lot of attention lately to uh, humanities in social justice programs. For instance, we had a conference recently at UCSB on teaching humanities in prisons. Um, does it make a difference uh, to you if your candidates have been involved in these kind of programs, or does it matter? Does it make the, evaluate the candidate value more, is valued more because of that? So at a place like LMU, yes, uh, because our mission is social justice. And uh, being a Jesuit institution, that's, that would, your application would be at the top of the pile if you very clearly framed your work in relation to LMU's mission. Um, yes, for sure. Same thing at, at a place like a community college, absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Same place at the UC. One of the, one of the things that you're evaluated on is diversity and inclusiveness and that's getting to be less lip service and more actual reality. And so involvement in programs like that, involvement in research um, collaborations around those kinds of themes, uh, in your cover letters, uh, developing classes around those things, as long as it's based on research, right? It's evidentially based, all our classes are in the sciences. And, uh, but yeah, that would be a plus. Yeah, agreed. I mean, we were we also require now all st all applicants to submit a statement on diversity and inclusion about how you incorporate um, those and embody those ideas in your teaching and in your research. And so that gives you um, a way to demonstrate with experience how you do that. Can I just ask you guys? Um, to expand a little bit on the diversity statement and because we have had, Lisa and I have had some questions about how do I write this diversity statement thing and um, so do you have any specific tips about maybe what that should, maybe not what it should include because you just talked about that but kind of what kind of structure are you looking for there? What, what kind of well, I think information? Elizabeth well, I think everybody's theme here is that you rise to the top if what you're doing fits the mission of the institution, the needs and the mission of the institution. So if it's teaching, if it's teaching and research and service, then I would have a section on each of those and how your, your philosophy and your actions and your involvements and your activities and your previous experiences speak to diversity and inclusion in teaching and then the same thing in research and then the same thing in service because you can you 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 may not teach classes on social justice you know like social justice in biology that maybe there is some but i don't know what it is but right so your teaching might not be able to speak directly to social justice your practices in the classroom could right but you could um, you could be involved in in um, ac activities outside the classroom that you know that would also speak to that theme. Yeah, I would agree with that. And then maybe one one other uh, point to add to that is is um, the the um, you know there's not one way to answer this diversity you know inclusiveness uh, equity statement on these applications. Um, however. 
I would encourage you to have specifics in yes. there as yeah. opposed to just, you know, institutions have sort of moved beyond the, having these on there as lip service. They are now used to rule out applications. So, so you're really going to need to have some specifics on there of how you have addressed this and or are going to address this. Uh, in your class, in your research, in your service, whatever it might be, but it needs to be specific as opposed to just, you know, regurgitating terms. Yeah. yeah. Right, this, this is going to be our last question because we've only got three minutes left. So. It's a lot of pressure. Uh, if you don't like this question, we can move on to somebody else. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so uh, I'm just wondering. You know, we're talking about first year, first few months or whatever of uh, being a new hire in, you know, these different institutions. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what your advice would be to a new faculty um, or even just in the application process and interview process of um, how to pinpoint and learn the um, culture of the department and how to move within it as a new hire because that's something I'm concerned about for sure. You know, I think it's similar to graduate school. Um, I remember starting as a graduate student and thinking, oh, wow, those students, I need to get in with them because they obviously have the ear of my advisor. And, and then I, you know, I didn't jump in. I observed. And it turned out that they were, weren't everything that I had thought they were. <laughs> so, so my advice would be to observe. And, and don't get caught up in politics. Just do your job. and. You know, going back to what I said at first, be present, do it well, um, be a good colleague, but try to avoid the politics. Um, and I, academic departments, as you are experiencing here at UCSB as a graduate student, are political. Um, and just do your best to fly above it, and don't, don't get, don't get um, too wrapped up in it. Yeah, I don't know what others. No, I completely agree. Don't get don't get caught up in it, and then and then um, do your job, like you said. And then also, my other recommendation would be to to reach outside of the department, um, and you know, kind of figure out what other people have to say about that. Yeah. I think I think about finding mentors, and we talk a lot. I mean, we talk a lot about mentors, and it's incredibly hard to find a good one. And sometimes you'll be assigned one, and it won't be a good fit. All of that happens. But I think about mentors in three ways. I think I'd find a mentor that's um, a newer faculty member inside your department, right? I think I'd find a, a mentor who's also a more senior faculty member, maybe your chair inside your department, because their perspectives and views will be different. And then I'd find two mentors outside your department, right? Um, and it may be someone who does research similar or has similar sort of um, goals and alignments. Um, to you, but in a different discipline, or it could be someone completely outside. My guess is almost every institution you get hired at will have a, f a like a first week of welcome for new faculty. Um, I met some of my most present and valuable colleagues uh, at that that first week of welcome. And I was so intimidated that first week that I, when I first met them, and I met them, and I thought there's not a chance that I would will ever meet like your awesomeness, right? <laughs> um, but it turns out um, they felt the same way, right? So it's, but it's like until you make that connection, until you find those people who can be sort of equal level mentors and above level mentors, um, that you don't, you won't know that. Um, but that I would think inside and outside and multiple levels. Yeah. All right, I would like us to all say a big thank you.